Good morning, Wellspring. It's so good to see you. Let's stand up this morning in, uh, in honor and worship our God. It's so good to come together as the body of Christ to worship him. come to crown you, Lord, our Lord, this morning, and we just come to uh, lift up the name of Jesus Christ. God, as we come together as your people, may you uh, join us here in this place. God, may you indwell our praises and inhabit our praises today, we pray. Uh, You're welcome here, God, to move and work as you please. May you work in our hearts. May you work in our minds and align them with your word today, we pray. And we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's so good to hear, see you here this morning. Why don't you take a minute and just greet each other. Let's sing this out. We bow our hearts. We lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, and we surrender to the truth that all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. We choose to leave it all behind and turn our eyes towards the prize, the upward God of God in Christ. You have our hearts, Lord, take us. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Receive 
sing it out. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Every soul you save seeks out everything you made. creation standing now, lifting up your name. We're caught up in the angel song. We're gathered to your ancient throne. Children in our Father's arms, shouting out your Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Receive, receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Lord, we do pray that you receive our adoration, that we lift up to you, God, that you fill our hearts uh, with a, a great love for you. You're an awesome, mighty God, and, and uh, we're so grateful uh, for the fact, Lord, that you have laid down your life for us. And it's in, in response to that today, God, we just stand before you, your people, worshiping you, singing to you, God, preaching to ourselves these words that we're that we are uh, speaking and singing, reminding ourselves of what you've done for us, Lord. May we be overwhelmed once again today by your goodness. God, may our hearts be filled with love for you, pouring out uh, through songs and adoration, God, but through lives of adoration. God, very lives that are laid down for you as you laid down your life for us, Lord. We love you. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. I was an orphan lost at the farm, running away when I'd hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. Righteousness on my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you love me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cause. But Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone Jesus, you paid my debt In your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation Born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. 
the spirit you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own head full of rocks a heart made of stone the spirit you moved in me and at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened and on my darkened heart the light of Christ has shone Come into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven sin is sent by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone.
There's no name like your name, the name that is given to men. There's no other name given to men whereby they might be saved. Lord, Jesus, the name of Jesus, we exalt you today. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done at the cross. We thank you for your word. And Father, we just uh, turn to your word now and ask that you open our eyes and give us spiritual eyes and spiritual ears uh, to hear what the Spirit is saying to us through, through your word. Move in our hearts, God. God, may you uh, change our thinking anywhere where it's not aligned with your word. And God, may you give us power to live out every instruction that you give us as you have promised you will do, Lord. We thank you for your life-giving power that you give us, Lord, to live out what you've given. We love you and we pray, that, uh, pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. You can be seated. I'll be reading the scripture reference for this morning's sermon. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. So if you'd turn to your Bibles to that passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. The title is God's Man and God's Glory. But as for you, O man of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. Mm. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. May the Lord write these truths on our hearts this day. Amen. Pastor Brian. Thanks, Dan. Let's pray together. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, Holy is your name, and make your name holy in this place, and show us your glory. Your people are hungry. We've come for you. We've come to know you. We've come to draw near to you, Father, and we know you speak, and you move, and you transform through the word of God. So please speak this morning, and as Stan said, give us ears to hear as your people, and power to live out your instruction Change us at the heart level, Father, right now. Change us at the heart level to be a holy people and to be in awe of your glory. We prayed in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, if you have ever been tempted to throw in the towel on your faith or maybe just in your ministry and what God's called you to do, like we all have at some point, then this text this morning is going to be an encouragement for you. You ask the question, what's on the top of Paul's mind in terms of priorities for Timothy as he begins to conclude his letter to his son in the faith, Timothy? And what we see is he wants to encourage Timothy to not give up. To not give up despite the battles with the flesh in pursuing holiness, despite the struggles with false teachers there in Ephesus, despite the, the, the problem of being young, Despite the struggles of fear and timidity, physical ailments that Timothy seemed to have, despite so many apostates leaving the church, how discouraging. And Paul wants to encourage Timothy not to give up, to keep pressing on, fighting on, to fight diligently and faithfully, to be holy, to be unlike the world, and to grow in faith, and above all, to worship Christ, who is more glorious than we could possibly imagine. And so therein lies our hope this morning as his people, 
in the worship of a glorious God that we, through that, can endure and fight to the end because eternal life with the Lord awaits each one of us. And the subject of the text here is Paul's final charge to Timothy of the marks of a man of God. What distinguishes a man of God and the glory of the God he worships, the character, the attributes of the one that we serve. In the context, having just described the error of the false teachers and those who love money, Paul now calls Timothy to holiness and to faithfulness and to being captivated by the glory of God, not financial gain. The big idea for us, I believe, church, that we at Wellspring, we would live holy lives in awe of the glory of God. That we would live holy lives, we would be sanctified in awe of the glory of God. First, we'll consider the man of God, and secondly, the glory of God at the end of the text we just read. But first, the man of God, if you look at verse 11 with me again, he says, but as for you, O man of God. Paul uses this uh, simple but immeasurably rich title to, to, to speak of Timothy and his call to lead there at that church. Timothy is a man of God, meaning Timothy, you belong to God. You are God's personal possession. And what a sacred privilege that is for us, amen? And with it comes grave responsibility on our lives that we are belonging now to God. It's an interesting phrase that is used all over the place in the Old Testament. It's used to describe Moses and Samuel and Elijah and Elisha and David and tons of others. But interestingly, the phrase is used only once to describe Timothy in the New Testament. And while Timothy is unique in his calling as a pastor, not everyone's called to be a pastor, he is not unique in his calling to live as a man or woman of God. Amen? That's what we're all called to do and to be. That's our identity, If you are in Christ this morning, meaning you've repented and believed upon him for salvation, then you are a man or a woman of God because you've been ransomed. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your life is not your own anymore. You belong to God. So you you are, objectively speaking, you are God's man. You are God's woman. but we don't necessarily display that all the time, right? It's our identity, but our lives often don't reflect the new identity that we have. And those that seem to really reflect that identity, they exemplify love and holy lives and fear of God and servants' hearts. We often designate to them the title man of God or that's a, a woman of God. And yet it's what we all are purchased by Christ, yet not what we all live and reflect And so the question is, what are some of those things that designate someone who truly lives out that identity as one who is owned by God? So the first thing we we see about a man of God is that a man of God flees from sin. Flees from sin. Look at verse 11 with me again. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. He starts there, verse 11, saying, but, but, and he's saying, as for you, Timothy, he's sharply contrasting Timothy with the the slick money lovers that he just spoke of in the preceding verses, those who, who are using God as a means to gain. And he says, but you are not like that. They are money's men, but you are God's man. They are the world's men, but you're a heavenly man. You have a new identity. And he says, so... Because you're a man of God now, flee these things. And I want you to see the the gospel-centeredness of that obedience. It's because first you are owned by God, purchased by the blood of Christ, that he then calls us to obedience and fleeing sin. It's not the other way around. We can't first obey God and get him to save us. We need to accept his free gift in Christ and become purchased by the cross, a man or woman of God in faith, and then... We flee these things because we are owned by God, because we've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And so he says, flee, flee these things. And the these things here in particular, in the context, are the love of money, the desire to be rich, the covetousness in our heart that shows a lack of contentment in Christ. 
to flee using God as a means to some other financial earthly gain. He says, Timothy, flee these things. Run. Run from them. Church, we are not to flirt with sin. We're we're not to see how close we can get and still not sin. That is foolishness. We are to be people that always have our shoes laced up, ready to run fast and far from sin and temptation. Amen? To go the other direction, to flee covetousness, to run toward Christ, to kick Satan in the face by taking whatever money and things God's given you and using as much of it as you can to make much of Jesus and invest eternally. Not to see how much can I keep and get away with and still obey? What's the percentage? But how much can I give away and say no to covetousness and to Satan and to temptation? To flee it as far as you can. And of course, this applies not just to covetousness, but to all sin, all temptations. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You hear that? Escape. That's what the man or the woman of God is looking for. We're looking for an escape like Joseph in Potiphar's house, right? When sin wants to pull you down into bed with it, you shed your cloak and anything else holding you back and you run. You escape. You flee these things. But we don't just flee from sin. A man of God not only flees, but also follows after holiness, pursues holiness. Look again at verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. You flee from sin and you run toward holiness. You take off the flesh, but you have to put on the spirit, right? You take off the old man, but you got to put on the new man, created after the likeness of Jesus Christ. And this is so important. This is one of the keys for biblical counseling. So many Christians that are seeking to get unstuck from their their sin and those habits and things that they, they hate, they're merely looking for ways to stop doing what they hate, to stop sinning and, and that habit that they keep coming back to, to stop it. But what's often the case is, one, you're not successful when that's your approach, and two, even if you are, you just end up redirecting that to a different fleshly habit. <laughs> if it's just merely trying to stop sinning, then we end up with a different idol in the end. We got to repent of sin, but we must also pursue righteousness in its place. We, we, we have to, those, those sinful choices must be replaced with righteous choices. Your idolatry needs to be fought with redirecting your heart, your worshiping heart. It's always worshiping, we're always worshiping. But to redirect it to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, otherwise you just find a new idol. And so in biblical counseling, the goal is to help people take the scriptures and apply them to their lives by creating good habits and righteous practices in place of the sinful ones. And and, and this is the thing, churches. God loves us so much. He doesn't just want to forgive us of our sin. He knows what will bring us the greatest joy. He wants us to honor him by pursuing after holiness, righteousness. Far from his ways being constraining and, and, and stealing joy in life, it's the exact opposite. In following after righteousness and holiness, it's true freedom and it's true joy in knowing God to follow after, as he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Pursue these things, church, as men and women of God. Thirdly, a man of God fights for faith. Look at verse 12 with me. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Probably they're speaking about his baptism as we give testimony of our faith. But he says here, fight the good fight of faith. A man of God is known 
by what he fights for. And church, we are called to fight. We're called to fight. We are in warfare. We're in a battle against the devil, against the flesh, against the resistance of a fallen world that loves sin and lies and hates holiness and the truth. There's a battle raging, and sadly, many Christians just don't seem to think that they're in battle. And we live kind of like we're AWOL. You know, we're just, we're seeking ease and comfort and to make friends with the enemy, really, to our own ruin and destruction. But we see here a man of God is one who is keenly aware of the danger in which we are constantly living And not just the danger around us, but the danger that lives within us. The remaining sin that is exceptionally deceitful in my heart that I need to be sanctified and purified from. And so he fights, the man of God fights the good fight of faith. The fight of faith. Now, what does that phrase mean? There's two ways I think we can understand that phrase, fight of faith. And one would be this. Since our faith is often threatened by doubt and and unbelief and temptation, we always are are seeking to fight to maintain faith. that, That phrase, fight of faith, would mean the struggle to keep on believing God, to keep on trusting his promises. I need to do that every day, amen? We need to be continually fighting for faith. And so the other way, though, to understand this phrase, fight of faith, would be this, that we must fight the good fight of faith in the sense that Faith is the weapon that we are using to attain some other victory beyond faith itself. Where where faith isn't just the goal, but we're maintaining faith in order to reach some other victory through the means of faith. Now, I want to show you that I think Paul has both of these ideas in mind and that they always go together. And I'll show you just from the context. If you look first at verse 11 where he tells Timothy to pursue righteousness, godliness, and faith. Faith, you see that? Timothy's already a believer, right? So he's, he he, he can't mean get saved. He's saying, attain more faith, grow in faith, hold on to the faith that you have. And, And so this would be fighting the good fight of faith in the first sense, where the goal is faith itself. We're supposed to be men and women of faith. We're growing in faith. And that is so important because if you think that you can begin to coast in your Christian life, if you think you could just let your guard down, you start to think that your past faith will be sufficient for today's struggles, you're going to be rudely awakened. Amen? That you and I need to every day grow in faith, coming to the Lord in prayer and worship and to his word where God grows our faith. So that we're, we're, we're refilled and we're reawakened and strengthened in faith in him and his promises every day. So that's the first sense, but the, the, the second aspect of fighting for faith is illustrated in verse 12 where faith is the weapon that we use to attain a further victory and reward. Look at that next phrase. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. So the the fight of faith is not just to maintain faith, but to to use faith. Faith is the, the means by which God gives us the greater victory in the end when we meet him face to face and take hold of eternal life. When we're with him, it's as if, uh, imagine one of our coaches for our Olympic boxing team, right before the third and decisive round and the boxer's going up and the coach yells out, fight the good fight, brother, lay hold of the gold, right? It's right there, you can taste it, and you gotta keep pressing in, you gotta keep fighting, but it's right there for you to take hold of, and so we're to fight to win the gold, which Paul calls the crown of eternal life. By means of what? Persevering faith. Growing in faith every day. Again, this is so important for us to get to. I think one of the reasons that there is so little deep, earnest, passionate concern for the godliness of the contemporary church, our godliness as his people, is because this truth is little understood. The truth that 
Eternal life is laid hold of by persevering in faith. There, there seems to be such a cavalier, just kind of superficial attitude toward our own holiness and our own faith, our need to daily grow in faith because people do not believe that their eternal life depends on it. No, we've watered the gospel down to Jesus can be your fire insurance, right? You just accept him as Savior, and you're automatically going to heaven. When the Bible speaks of saving faith, because that's not faith. The Bible speaks of saving faith as more than just wanting to get out of hell and be forgiven. You don't need a new heart to desire that. Any rational person would say, yeah, give me that. Saving faith in Scripture is a new heart that trusts God and desires to obey God and sees God through the eyes of the heart as an all-satisfying treasure that we will gladly submit to and follow all the days of our lives. We will do so all life long as the evidence that we truly have been born again. We will persevere in faith. And so we need to understand this so that we practice what Paul said in Philippians 2.12, he says to Christians, work. It's a work. It's a fight. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a work. It's a fight. It's a fight of faith. But you notice he's not saying work for your salvation. He's saying work out your salvation. Work from the saving grace that God has given you as the evidence that you are truly his. Do so earnestly and intensely, he says, fear and trembling in the way we seek to work out our salvation because my faith is feeble. If I'm left to myself, God help me. I need Christ to satisfy me and build me up every day. And that's exactly what he promises to do in Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. As he says in chapter 1, verse 6 of Philippians, he will finish the work he started in you. It is God. It's of God. But it's not automatic. It's God working in and through our efforts in sanctification to grow in faith, to fight the fight of faith, zealous to know Christ and to make him known and be faithful to this until the day he returns and we take hold of eternal life in his kingdom. And that brings me to the fourth point here, lastly, about a man of God. The man of God is faithful until his coming. The man of God is faithful till his coming. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 Here's the charge from Paul. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in the testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Here's the charge. I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the charge to Timothy and to us this morning, church, is to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. What's he talking about there? The commandment, I believe, should be understood as the entire revealed will of God in the word of God. There's nothing in the context that's a limiting feature to suggest a more narrow interpretation. The Bible all throughout the Old Testament is called the commands of God, the commandment. And I believe that's what he's talking about here, the word of God. And he says Timothy is to keep it unstained, to keep the word of God, the commandment, unstained, meaning you guard it and you protect it and you believe it and you proclaim it and you defend the truth of it. And that's our charge this morning as we've talked in previous weeks. That's our charge to hold on to this truth as the truth that we all need and all the world needs. To proclaim it faithfully, to believe it with all our hearts. And so he's to keep it unstained. And secondly, Timothy here is to keep it free from reproach. Free from reproach. And as we've spoken in past weeks, again, this theme that's constantly in 1 Timothy, that our lives need to match the testimony of Scripture. Our lives need to match our testimony of faith in Jesus Christ, right? We are sinners saved by grace. We are not in any way claiming perfection. We're not claiming to be holy like God is holy. 
But we are saying that in my forgiveness and grace in Christ, I am being made holy by the Holy Spirit. And that's his job in me. And therefore, how I live matters very much to our testimony of the truth of Scripture and to live in a way that is not above reproach, brings reproach, not just on you, but on the Word of God, the commandment. This is our charge, to hold on to the truth, to believe it, to proclaim it, and to live it. So it's unstained, and it's free from reproach, and What a charge that is. And you see who we're accountable to in this charge, verse 13. Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus. There are the two sovereign persons right there that we're accountable to for this charge. And Paul, to remind us that this day of accounting is coming, he says at the end of verse 14, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be faithful to preach and live this truth until the appearing of our Lord Jesus. Christ is returning, church. Christ is coming back. He's coming back in the same way that he ascended to heaven, physically, gloriously, with resurrection life, with complete sovereignty to set up his kingdom and to put all enemies underneath his feet. He is coming back and that's happening and this expectation of his imminent return ought to motivate us as his people to be faithful to not give up don't give up hope don't throw in the towel the fight can be hard it is a fight but keep pressing on in the fight of faith because Christ is coming soon don't let the enemy lull you to sleep through worldliness and temptations and ease and Comfort, and money, and hobbies, and vacations, and sex, and success, and food, and drink. Don't let the enemy lull you to sleep and blind you to your singular glorious focus and purpose for existence, which is to know Christ and make him known, church. That's what we live for, and to do so faithfully until he returns. That's what marks a man of God, a woman of God. Now, what motivates us in this above all things? Secondly, the glory of God. We saw first the man of God. Now we consider this at the end, the doxology here, the glory of God. Hearts in awe of the glory of God. That's the powerhouse for all of us being, living as men and women of God. Look at verse 15. Each phrase here expresses the transcendent, incomparable greatness of God. Verse 15. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, who no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. This is what we call a doxology. It's a hymn of praise to God. And the book of 1 Timothy actually begins with and ends with a doxology. And it's important for us to remember that the goal of all theology The study of God is for the purpose of doxology, the praise of the glory of God. All that we learn about God is for the praise of the glory of God. The devil knows more about God than any of the greatest saints, and it does him no good because he hates everything he knows. To just study to know is pointless. Study to worship. To praise, to be in awe, that's the goal. And Paul here gives the single greatest motivating factor for a man or woman of God, namely the character of the God that we serve and worship. God's glory displayed through his perfect attributes. And Paul here in our text exults in many of those attributes that we're going to look at. But this is, this is so important, I think, for Christians today because so many are tempted to put off uh, the study of doctrine. And they're almost put off by it. Like, we don't need to to study doctrine. What matters is how you live, right? How you love. That's all that matters. But Paul knew that theology changes the heart which controls behavior. 
Theology changes the heart, which controls behavior. In other words, how a person lives reflects what they really believe about who God is. How a person lives reflects what you really believe about God. J.B. Phillips rightly pinpointed the problem with ineffective Christians by saying, quote, your God is too small. That was the problem. A.W. Tozer, he states the issue with powerful clarity in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, saying, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He, He gets it. Our understanding of God is what is controlling us. That's the driving factor in our behavior. And so there are a few things as important as the study of God and his nature and his attributes. So I want you to behold your God this morning and worship him. Firstly, behold and be in awe of his aseity. Aseity. If you look back, jump back to verse 13 with me. We're going to see some of his glory there at verse 13 and 14. He says, first, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. You see those words there? God gives life to all things. What theologians have called the aseity of God, the Latin a from and seity from self, from self. And here's the idea. God is the creator of of all things, and he brings life itself into existence for the material world, and he is the sustainer of all that life, holding all life into existence. And of course, the five-year-old asks mom and dad, well, how can that be, right? I mean, who gives God life? No one. No one. He has life from self, a seity. He has life within himself, This is, God is independently self-existing. He is the uncaused cause of all things. He is the source of all things from which everything originated and exists and continues to exist today, the ever-present power that sustains all life. Acts 17.25, God doesn't need anything (laughs) since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God said it this way in how he declared his name to Moses. He said what? I am who I am. He is the I am, eternally self-existing, completely independent, having no need, sufficient in and of himself. We have life by him. We are completely, and all things in creation are completely dependent on him for it, while he always is. God is, church. That's the the start of you want to know who God is. He is, always is. Secondly, behold the glory of his invincibility. His invincibility. Look at verse 14. He charges them to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. The man of God understands that God's plan in history culminates in the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ in his visible glorious return to earth to judge and set up his kingdom. Here's that promise, one of them in Matthew 24, just listen. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the power of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in His glory, and all the angels with Him. And when the Son of Man comes in His glory, He will sit on His glorious throne. That's coming. That's coming. Paul says at verse 15, which He will He will display this at the proper time. Nobody, no thing in the universe can stop the invincible purpose of God. He's invincible. I mean, he's too powerful to be overcome or defeated. And so what he has promised, he will do. 
as it says in Job 42, verse 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He is invincible in all that he purposes to do. Thirdly, church, behold the glory of his blessedness. His blessedness, there at verse 15 where the doxology starts, he says, he who is the blessed, the blessed, I love this about God. This transformed my life years ago. Listen, the Greek word for blessed, makarios, do you want to know what it means? You ready? Happy. Happy. Content. Fulfilled. This is, this is God who is the eternally happy God. He is the blessed God. He has an eternal, infinite joy and, and fullness and delight in himself such that we will never be able to fully appreciate what his joy is like for himself. It's of such a holy other nature. Why is this? It's because God is in his being the perfect union of all things. And, and so he is all-sufficient, infinitely sufficient, glorious, and therefore free from all miseries free from all frustrations, free from all anxieties. And not only is he free from those things, but, and this would make sense, he, he perfectly knows his own blessedness, follow me, which means he desires nothing more than what he has because it is impossible for him to be more, more or less blessed than what he is. That's the idea of his infinite self-sufficiency and blessedness. Paul says it this way in chapter 1 of the same book, in verse 11. He's been entrusted with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. It's the glory of the happy God. In other words, his glory consists very much in the fact that he is happy beyond our wildest imagination. You cannot deny God infinite joy, and he still be all glorious. To be infinitely glorious is to be infinitely happy, and praise God for that. You want to know why? How many of you want to spend eternity with an unhappy God? <laughs> right? It's what makes it good news. It's what makes it good news. I mean, what would that mean for our joy if God was unhappy? What if with a miserable God, is the gospel good news? Paul says it's the gospel, good news of the glory of the blessed God. Jesus invites us to spend eternity with the blessed Father, saying, enter into the joy of your master, right? Not the misery of your master. Jesus lived and died so that his joy, which we know is God's joy, John 15, would be in us and our joy might be full. It's where our joy comes from, knowing the infinitely happy God. Fourthly, behold the glory of his sovereignty at verse 15. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the only sovereign, Paul says, because he alone is God. To be God is to be sovereign. To be sovereign is to be God. Isaiah 46, 9 I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Therefore, there is no one in the universe to vie with him for control. It's his. It means God has absolute power and control over all things to do whatever he pleases. He is so different, other than us. In his power, in his sovereignty, in his holiness. God, it says in uh, Psalm 115.3, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Which means God is never constrained to do a thing that he despises. Understand that. He is, he is never backed into a corner where his only recourse is to do something he hates to do. He does whatever he pleases from the smallest, seemingly insignificant, random event of the dice being rolled. From that to the greatest evils of Satan and man in crucifying the Son of God, even in the death of Christ and all the evil there, it said in Acts 4.27, even that, they did what your hand and your plan had predestined to take. 
not just in that act, but indeed in all things. Ephesians 1.11, he predestined us according to the purpose of him who works all things. That's a sweeping statement. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. He is the one and only sovereign. He is over all creation, all history, all time and space, all planets and stars, all the heavenly hosts, all the decisions and wills of men, all of Satan and his demons. And if he wasn't, what confidence can you have that he is actually going to win in the end? I mean, if God isn't sovereign, what assurance do you have that all things will culminate in a new heaven and a new earth and Satan forever cast in the lake of fire? The sovereignty of God is often debated in terms of its extent over the will of man, but let's not forget this morning that this doctrine is one of the most encouraging, strength, faith-strengthening, comforting realities in all of Scripture. I love the sovereignty of God. I worship a sovereign God. If you know him as such, why be anxious? Right? Why despair? Why get frustrated? He is sovereign and he is working all things together for your good. The sovereign one loves you and he is for you. So who can be against you, right? Love the sovereignty of God. Behold his glory there. Behold his glory in his eternality. At verse 16, who alone has immortality. In Paul's culture, the Romans worship their emperors as being immortal, but Paul says God alone has immortality. The Greek there, Athanasia, meaning deathless. God has an unending quality of life, is incapable of dying. John 5, 27, the Father has life in himself. But we know that it's more than just not being able to die because even angels and men are said to be immortal in that sense, that we, we have a starting point. We, we came into existence at some point, but then we're said to be immortal. We're going to live forever ever in either eternal life or eternal hell. But God is immortal alone in the sense that he has no beginning and no end. I think it's like impossible for our minds to comprehend. We can kind of get a glimpse of what it means to, to not cease to exist, but to start to try to think about what that was in eternity past to never begin existing. Well, I mean, it's mind-boggling. Isaiah 40, 28 calls him the everlasting God. Moses said in Psalm 90, verse 2, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Church, you can be comforted today in the knowledge that God is above history. He is beyond time. No matter what happens in our brief span on earth here, the deathless eternal one is your God. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your refuge. Lastly, behold the glory of his holiness. His holiness at verse 16, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. This is describing for us the glory of his holiness. This is the blazing, all-consuming fire of the holiness of God's nature and perfections. Who, who can't, he can't even be approached by us. It's unapproachable light. There's a blinding glory and radiance of such that we can't come near him. No eye can see him. We can't see him in his true nature like that. In that sense, he is the hidden God. He's the hidden God. And if God had not revealed himself to us, had come out of his holy habitation, man would have no knowledge of him. He's that holy and in this day and age of such casual familiarity with God, it serves us well to remember his utter infinite holiness and transcendence. He is beyond us. While he's a loving father who draws near to us through the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace we find therein, we yet remember that he is an all-consuming fire blazing brightly in holy hatred and separation from all evil and sin. That is his nature of such perfections and but for the cross of Jesus. 
We could not look on him. We could not know him. We could not experience his favor, his love. A sight of the holiness of God, church, like that Isaiah saw of the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe is filling the temple with glory. That vision of the holiness of God would absolutely transform us. And it's my daily pursuit to see him as he truly is. Such a vision of God and his holiness would rid us so quickly of all of our flippancy, our irreverence, our shallow, casual worship and prayer. I remember a church right by my house down in California that we had to go by all the time and its core values was on the church sign was real, relaxed, relevant. And it bothered me every time. Like of the, of the, the core values that make you a people, it relaxed. That's, that's one of your big things. Don't you know that the human soul is longing for transcendence? For something utter, utterly unique and beyond us? And when you come into the presence of holiness, it's the opposite of the empty, trivial relaxation of the world. They get enough of that. When we come into the presence of holiness, it's joy-filled fear and trembling and awe of who he is. Amen? Behold the glory of his holiness today, which is what we ought to do, is we ought to respond in worship. And you see that right at the end of verse 16, Paul Concludes, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Here's who he is. Now worship him. Give him honor. Claim his glory. Declare, ascribe to him who he is and worship him. That's what we exist to do. God made us to do that church. And let me remind you once again that God is in himself perfectly sufficient. He did not create man to fill up something lacking in himself as if he needed us to eternally compliment him? No, out of the overflow of his infinite sufficiency and glory, he made us and designed us to share in that glory. To find our greatest joy in the praise of his glory, especially the glory of his grace. His grace I mean, how can we, what hope would we have as sinners to know and enjoy and love and be loved by such a glorious being but for the grace of God, right? The grace that made a way at the cross where the Holy Son died in the place for unholy sinners. And that's the grace we have this morning. We are to praise him for the glory of his grace and to praise him for all that we know of him as revealed in the word of God. That's the goal of theology. That's the goal of my preaching. This is a means to an end. That we would worship, that we would praise him. This is our highest purpose. This is our supreme satisfaction to live for his praise and not our own. To make much of Jesus, not to be made much of. And that church is where we will be sanctified. That's where we will grow in holiness when we worship in his holy presence. It's where we are transformed. We all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. That's where we grow in Christ, in the worship of his holy presence. Let us be a people who are in awe of the glory of God. Men and women of God in this community that are captivated by the glory of God. That's what I'm asking God to do in us this morning as we respond now in a time of singing and praise and offering and prayer. So let's pray together. Lord, you are beyond anything my words can describe. I've tried with my feeble effort to exalt you with words. But now, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, give that spiritual sight that apprehends a vision of you beyond just what mere words and human minds can. Fill this place with a sense of your holiness and your presence and your love and your grace so that we are changed and we are captivated. We are in awe of you to worship you, God. How great you are. How holy is your name. Thank you. Meet us in this moment and change us forever because of it. We prayed in Jesus' name and everybody said,
Amen. Amen.